thank you very much. And now I would like to introduce our last speaker of today. Um, she's a chemist who will, will try to convince you she's a biologist and don't believe her. Um, I will be talking about um, what exactly I think we should send out there or what would be the easiest, the easiest or the most uh, credible possible mechanism of spreading life um, from the point of view of an actual experimental, experimental person. So when you think about what do we have um, at our disposal, we have this amazing richness, amazing variability of life on Earth. But when you really think about it, all of biological science up until today was done on a sample size that equals one, because we only have one type of modern terrestrial life. So what we know about life is all based on organisms that came from this one last universal common ancestor on one planet. We don't know anything about life under any different conditions. And that is kind of a problem when you think about trying to spread life elsewhere. Let's not even be ambitious. I'm not thinking galaxy level. I'm just thinking what if we want to try to seed life on Mars? How do we do it? What do we do? Well, we need to have a reality check of physical chemical conditions under which life can operate. We need to think about pressure. We need to think about temperature, water avail availability of water, and other parameters that life, that life cell can deal with or within what limits can we actually expect a life cell to operate. So what would you do? Um, a lot of people here talked about bacteria. I actually don't think we should send bacteria and I don't think we'll get bacteria from space. Um, what I would do if I were um, asked to try to develop life that is supposed to operate under completely new conditions is I would say I would try to learn based on modern terrestrial life, but I would like to start with a clean chassis and build life from scratch to actually make life that will look or behave in kind of a way that will match the conditions that we will meet wherever we want to go. So this is um, basically a very brief introduction. Um, those of you who have heard Marilyn's excellent talk this morning are probably already familiar with the concept of synthetic minimal cells. So we're basically chemists that pretend to be biologists and we're building our own cells from scratch. We're building those liposomal chemical bioreactors that, are, that have some, but not all, properties of natural life. And the really nice thing about synthetic cells is that they are like jigsaw puzzles. That they can be made by combining elements of different organisms. So I'm not advocating here for reinventing entire biochemistry. I'm not that smart. I'm just trying to take parts of different organisms that work for me under particular conditions and put them back together to build something that's different, that has some kind of a new properties that we do not have in current existing life. Um, why do I think this is a better way of going about it rather than re-engineering a existing living cell? Well, most of, most of the time um, when we try to engineer a living cell, a living cell has something to say about it and it, most of the time it says no. I'm trying to re-engineer bacteria to do what we want to do it, um, those of you who do metabolic engineering know it's relatively hard to convince a bacteria to express even one or a, uh, one pathway that is not intended for a bacteria to be expressed. So if you think about sending life somewhere hostile, um, the conditions like radiation, um, presence of ions, presence of small molecules will be extremely limiting for a terrestrial organism that its entire business model is based on surviving on Earth. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to build those synthetic minimal cells that can be kind of designed and tailored to uh, conditions. We obviously don't know very well about those conditions yet, as we're going to see in a second. But we're trying to basically build an organism that is faster to work with um, from the discovery, from the scientific point of view, is cheaper to work with. And you can mix and match different elements to build kind of whatever you want. And one of the best um, kind of examples that was given to me when I just started in this field is um, when you do physics, you can count on reproducibility. When you do chemistry, you can count on reproducibility. When you do biology, reproducibility becomes this dirty word that nobody wants to, to, to say. And the reason for that is every natural cell is slightly different. And so a signal coming from an, a, every natural cell will be much more messy because every cell is slightly different in your population. And so controlling natural cells, reprogramming them to do what you want is also going to be much harder. Synthetic cells are dumb. They're not alive. Um, at, at least I don't consider them alive. They're just dumb bioreactors that do what you want most of the time. So if we want to program them to do something very specific, that by definition is easier than trying to reprogram a complex, messy natural cell that we don't even understand. And so those synthetic cells, they're 
essentially liposomal bioreactors that express proteins. Um, the thing I really like about them is that you can compare them to molecular machines. They're customizable. They're, um, you can build a synthetic cell with a specific purpose in mind. You can assemble it any way you want. And the nice thing is, is that if your design doesn't work, what you can do is you can swap elements of it. You cannot take a live cell and suddenly decide you're going to use a completely different library of pRNA, for example. Um, this has been done to an extent. People do introduce artificial colon biases into live cells, for example. But you cannot just say, OK, tomorrow I'm switching all the pRNA molecules in my cell. Or tomorrow I'm switching all the ribosomes in my cell. You can do that in a synthetic cell because it's so modular. Now, when you think about space exploration, nice thing about something that is modular is that you can write down a recipe for it. And if you can write down a recipe for something, that also means you can transmit that recipe to a place elsewhere that doesn't actually require material transfer. And this is concept that um, a lot of people, when they think about space exploration, they think about sending biology somewhere. Um, you think of steady stream of sending biology. You cannot, right now at least, we cannot send, let's say, a strain of bacteria to a remote location without an actual physical transfer of materials. So let's say we engineer a strain that we think is going to colonize Mars. We send it there, it has soft landing or crashes. It turns out it doesn't really want to live on Mars, it's dead. We have to go back, re-engineer a strain, send it again, crash it again, see if it survives. If we manage to build kind of a biochemical synthetic cell assembler, send that to Mars, hope it doesn't crash, set it up, and then start churning out different kinds of, diff of synthetic cells that we might think might survive under specific conditions. If they don't work, the next iteration of the experiment, experiment can happen by basically re reprogramming our synthesizer. So we obviously think of this idea uh, within this, the boundaries of the solar system exploration. Um, I'm not an expert in anything really, but definitely not in anything outside solar system. So I'm not arguing that this is the way to see life through galaxies. But you can imagine sending basically libraries of those dumb little bioreactors that has some possibilities of becoming self-sufficient under certain conditions and trying to see what takes basically. So the question is, how do you do it? Um, I just made a case of how synthetic cells are simpler, easier to work with than natural cells. But it's still a relatively crazy idea when you think about it. You would try to make an entire cell from scratch. So obviously not a single lab is going to do it alone. Nobody's going to do it alone. This is one of the biggest, I think at least, it's one of the biggest challenges of, of uh, biology right now is if we can actually make alternative life forms, how would we go about it? Well, the way we want to go about it is um, as a community. Um, this, uh, basically the idea of trying to make cells from scratch, as we heard this morning from Marilyn, is not just something that one or two labs came up with. There's literally dozens of us. There's a whole community of people that want to build cells, and we do not define what we want to build. We, as this worldwide community, have a goal of trying to build something from scratch that's engineerable, understandable, and can in some way resemble a living organism. And so if we want to actually um, have this community to be successful, what we want to do is we want to build something that most of you will actually recognize as a live cell. And then we can start thinking of sending it somewhere to Mars, possibly elsewhere. So what can we actually do with synthetic cells? Let's say we already have those synthetic cells and we send them to Mars. Can we grow potatoes? Not quite. What can we actually do with those synthetic cells? So in terms of the chemistry and biochemistry, most of what a synthetic cell is, it's a liposome. So it's a lipid membrane that's very similar to all of your own cellular membranes. And it surrounds something called cell-free protein expression system. So it's basically soap bubble that makes proteins. It's a membrane, bilayer membrane, encapsulating protein expression system and encapsulating genes. Um, there are a lot of neat tricks that we can do to build synthetic cells in a very modular way. Um, we can design them in a way that um, we have a very, very precise control over expression of circuits inside it. We have very precise control over assembly of every single part of the cell. So that kind of appeals to me as a chemist and a chemical engineer is that assembling synthetic cells in many ways, it's not like growing cells where you just plate them and pray, but you're actually assembling them like kind of like on an assembly line. You're adding things together 
and at the end you end up with a bioreactor of as much complex or, or as little complexity as you want. And I'll give you a very brief overview of kind of some of the capacities that the synthetic cells already have and what we want them to have um, eventually is you can have, as in any other cell, you can have a genome. That genome can do stuff. It can differentiate. So we can build things that we call uh, pluripotent synthetic cells that can then differentiate into different lineages. Why is that cool? Well, because if you go somewhere and you're not quite sure what the conditions on the arrival will be, being able to evolve into different lineages or differentiate into different lineages helps you be prepared, helps you be able to make whatever molecules might happen to be needed at any point. Also, exchange of information. Groups work better together. If you have synthetic cell populations that are capable of horizontal gene transfer, we can have one population learn from the other. If, let's say, one population develops a trait, we're all talking here artificial evolution. If one population develops a trait that's beneficial, it can share it with another population, and we can study those processes um, really carefully. Another thing that we can do is we can assemble genetic circuits. Um, all of you probably have been to at least one talk in your life on biocomputing and how biocomputing is going to be this next big thing and how, how it is wonderful, and somehow we don't yet have biocomputers. Well, again, the reason for that is because cells say nope. If you can assemble a genetic circuit in a cell, it works to a to certain point and then it stops working because cells drift. So in synthetic cells, you can assemble genetic circuits in a way that is basically clean. There is no background to it because the cell's dead and there's no endogenous processes in there. So you can imagine that one day, we're not there yet, we're far from there yet, but one day we might be able to use synthetic cells as basically little biocomputers. Another thing you can do is you can make interesting things inside and then export them outside. So for example, if your goal is to increase concentration of a certain nutrient in your soil for potatoes on Mars, you can, de you can de design and basically design a synthetic cell that will only produce a certain nutrient under very specific certain conditions. One day maybe we can make synthetic eukaryotes. I think Marilyn will beat us to that um, with her approach, but if you have a synthetic cell that can export metabolites into a bigger cell, you can start building kind of a complex communities. You can also have different populations that interact with each other. Um, you can have synthetic cells interacting with natural cells. Um, this is mostly for the practical applications, like what Heath was talking about. Once we go up and we're going to be in space for a really long time, we need to have very flexible programmable metabolic engineering platform. And because synthetic cells are easier to design and program than natural cells, we can use them to control natural cells. And we have shown that already, that you can take synthetic cell population and use it, program it in a way that it controls an unmodified natural cell population. So this would be a really neat way of forcing natural cells to either scrub carbon from waste for you or produce, again, whatever small molecule, whatever metabolite, whatever drug you need at any given point. Um, and I'm, I'm out of time, so I would like to thank um, all of my collaborators, all of the funding agencies, all of the people that actually are doing the work, and I think we have time for one question and then we should move on. Thank you. You know the papers by Noiro and Liebschaber about 10 years ago, and Tetsuo Yoma, they're on the same track. I wonder how you're going to step beyond what they've done already. Um, so we are actually not working on division. Um, I don't want to work on division because it's too hard. Um, I know there are, there's a lot of people that are trying to get those um, little synthetic cells to, to start self-replicating. Um, I honestly don't know how to do it, so I, I'm not doing it right now. The way we're dividing them is extrusion, the old-fashioned um, extrusion through the membrane. Uh, but yes, there, so I guess what Dave was referring to are, uh, is work by people that are trying to build um, self-replicating liposomes using um, most of the time bacterial proteins. There are those cool bacterial proteins that create the rings that pinch the membrane and cause, could cause a liposome to divide. We haven't seen division ever yet. But we did see that the membranes can be pinched into something that sort of starts to re resemble budding yeast. So this is the state of the field right now in, in the division. Um, and we also know the, um, our colleagues um, at TU Delft are doing, making great progress towards division systems as well. So someone will crack that hopefully soon. Thank you. I think we should move on. 